to you to take back. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Really excited today. Um, thank you so much for celebrating my wife. We didn't know that that was going to happen. I thought that was, was very cool, very neat. I, I just want to say how much, I mean, you moms are really, you guys do a lot. You do a lot for us. And just a quick example of that. This morning, uh, right before coming on stage, and thank you, Tim, for your help, I'd sat on my coffee cup. So um, I sat down to send a message and sat on my coffee. So for the first and this was like just now. So if I turn around, you may see a wet spot yeah, on my, on my bottom. I will say at first it was warm and it felt great. <laughs> so uh, I was like, oh, this, is, this is not so bad. And, uh, and the other thing is I would say, who trusts me? Who let me come in here with an open cup of coffee? This is actually all of your fault. Um, so my, anyway, <laughs> my wife, that's what she deals with. She deals exactly with that. So I really wanted to pick something in this series, talking about these stories in the Bible. And, and when I, whenever I say story, this is something that happened. It's a, it's a true event. It, it's not a, a made-up story, but it's something that really happened. Um, and so as I was thinking about what to talk about today, I really wanted to honor moms. I really wanted to honor what you do, and I wanted to create an opportunity for you to just kind of feel acknowledged and feel seen. And there's a certain aspect of motherhood that, that almost nobody else can identify with and understand. And it's this love that you have for your children, for your family, love that you have, that you possess, that is just unbelievable. And, and I know that to be true because there's so many times and our family, where I look at my wife and I say, you wanted these kids. This is you. This, you wanted this. You know? And, and, she's, and I'll take it more and more and more. And so despite all the sleepless nights and, and everything, if you notice today she's not wearing glasses, it's because Wyatt has broken them. And we've now gone through four rounds of super glue. And she just, it doesn't, they no longer will hold together. And that's, that's mom's. That's the heart of mom. So this message is dedicated for you. And the title for today I've got is, is Hope Floats. And, and this is going to make more sense to you. This is going to uh, kind of uh, unravel itself for you. But, but this message here for you, th this is for you, mom. Okay? Th this, I want to like pause and make sure you understand that. Today's message is for you. So like prepare your heart. And what we're going to be looking at today is we're going to be looking at one moment of motherhood. There's one specific moment of motherhood that we're going to look at and connect with and identify with. You know, some of these messages that we do, I tell a big story and there is a story that's involved in this, but it's got a whole bunch of different points and takeaways and things like that. Today isn't that. Today we're going to look at one moment of motherhood and then there's going to be one takeaway at the end. And so that moment that we're going to look at is, is this. It's this moment here where well, you have this, this, this story, and, and they're going to put it on the screen for you. And it's when, so when she could no longer hide him, and we're going to revisit this. So if you don't know it, it's okay. When, could, when she could no longer hide him, she got him in a basket made of papyrus reeds, and she covered it with tar and pitch, making it waterproof. The only other place in the Bible where this is discussed is when Noah builds the ark. It, it's that kind of waterproofing. And then she put the child in it. And she set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. So the, the thing that I want to talk about is how do we get to a place where there's a mother putting a child in a basket and putting it uh, amongst the reeds in the Nile River? How do we end up there? You know, that, that's a very specific, peculiar situation. But how do we get to a place where a mother has waterproofed a basket and is setting her child afloat? Now, that, that's the journey that we're going to go on today. And that starts with a guy named Abraham. Now, Abraham, th this is going to be reviewed for those of you that know the Bible and you've been in church forever. But for those of you that don't, this is really interesting. This kind of plays into the story here. Abraham was the guy that God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. And, and mind you, if you don't know this, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they were super old and they couldn't have kids. They were like in their... It was almost, I don't, I'm going to lie if I say an age, but it was 80, 90, 100. It was very old. And so they, they were in that place and God said, I'm going to give you a child. And not only am I going to give you a child, he takes Abraham out and he has him look up at the stars. And when he looks up at the stars, God says, Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants more numerous than I'm going to make the stars in the heavens. 
And so Abraham puts his faith in God and, and he has a journey with God and he does end up giving birth and, and having a, a child named Isaac. And so now Abraham has this child named Isaac and Isaac, go ahead and switch that slide there, Jordan. And Isaac here ends up being um, a really significant part of the story in that Abraham has to take Isaac up onto a mountain and Isaac is like in his 30s and God tells Abraham, you're going to take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. And, and God was asking Abraham to have this huge amount of faith and, and all of that. And Abraham does that. He takes Isaac up and Isaac kind of submits to this as well. And right before he sacrifices Isaac on the altar, there's, there's, God says, hang on a second, stop. And he prepares a lamb in the bushes and they sacrifice that instead. But this promise of Abraham having all of these kids, this nation that's birthed out of Abraham, it gets passed down to Isaac. And then Isaac now holds the promise that God will birth a nation out of, his, out of his lineage, out of his family, and they would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. And so then Isaac, he has children, and one of them is Jacob. Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob plays a huge role because Jacob is, is, is the father of Israel. And, and Jacob is, is this father figure, and he has these two sons, and these two sons that he has... He's, he's got uh, uh, Esau and, no, sorry, Isaac had two sons. He had Jacob and Esau. Jacob is significant because Jacob tricks Isaac to get Isaac's blessing. Jacob also tricks his brother to get his brother's inheritance. That's actually over a bowl of beans. So his brother was so hungry that he said, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you beans if you give me, you know, your inheritance. And he says, yes. And then right before Isaac dies, he has this thing where he puts hair, goat hair on his arms and on his chest and makes himself smell like his brother and cooks like his brother and all that. And he tricks Isaac. And so Isaac gives Jacob this blessing. So, so Jacob, his life kind of starts with these two, starts with, with a trick. You know, him tricking his brother out of stuff. But even in that, so this, this lineage, this promise that God made to Abraham, God made to Abraham the promise. It passed to Isaac. That promise continued into Jacob. And then Jacob has 12 sons. And these 12 sons that, that are of Jacob are going to be what we would know now today as, as the tribes of Israel. And so that promise that, that God gave to Abraham, Abraham, look up into the sky. Can you count the stars? No. God says there's going to be more people of your descendants and there's going to be stars in the sky. Isaac carries that. Jacob carries that. And now Jacob has 12 sons, and they're going to carry that. And the, the names of their sons are, are here. You, you may not recognize um, a lot of these, but these would go on to become the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And you've got Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and Joseph. Now Joseph plays the, probably the most important role in this story here because these 12 sons of Jacob, which become the 12 tribes of Israel, you think they would be amazing. They would be super spiritual. They're not. They're actually horrible brothers. And they do this thing where they sell their brother Joseph into slavery. They originally were going to kill him. But they, they decide, okay, instead of killing him, let's sell him. They sell him into slavery. Joseph has this amazing life story. And Joseph ends up in the place of Egypt. He gets traded by slave traders, goes through jail, goes through all kinds of stuff, and he ends up in Egypt. And when he ends up in Egypt, he ends up becoming Pharaoh's like right-hand guy. So Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. And so, watch what's happened here. You've got Abraham that at once was in a land called Canaan. He was in this land, and God said, I want you to get up and go. Abraham says, where do you want me to go? God says, I'll tell you when you get there. So Abraham goes. He sets up camp. Isaac comes. Jacob comes. The 12 sons come. Joseph is the key that links these people to Egypt. Because while Joseph is in Egypt, there's a famine, which means there's no food. And so people needed to eat. Guess where they went? They went to Egypt. Why did they go to Egypt? Because Joseph was brilliant, and he built the storehouses of the Pharaoh so that they would have grain and food to get through the drought or to get through the famine. And so Joseph has 
He reunites with his brothers. They're terrified of him. They think this guy is truly going to kill us uh, once he finds out that we're the ones that sold him into slavery. Meanwhile, Joseph is like, I love my brothers so much, but he kind of like teases them a little bit and he plants, you know, something in their saddlebags to make it look like they stole something. And he's having like a nice kind of like poke at them. But it's this very emotional story of a reunion. And when they reunite, Joseph asks, he says, okay, I want you to go back and get my dad. I want you to get Jacob. And I want you to bring all your families down. And you're going to live with me in Egypt, which currently is the land of plenty. It's got plenty of food. And when they come down, they experience a season of favor. And this season of favor comes through Joseph. And Israel, they really had it made in Egypt. They, they did. They had tons of food. And the, the blessing that God spoke to Abraham where I will make your people a great nation, starts to happen. Because when they settle in Israel, they came over about 70 or 80 people in the family unit come over. And they settle in Egypt. And when they settle there, they start to multiply and grow and grow and grow. And they get rich and wealthy and they get powerful and they get strong. And they, they keep growing and growing and they become this incredibly powerful unit of people so much so that unfortunately joseph doesn't live forever their season of favor ends and when the season of favor ends through joseph israel's favor runs dry and when i say israel i mean the 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 tribes of israel everyone that moved with jacob into egypt that would be the nation of israel and their favor it runs dry Joseph dies, and after Joseph dies, there's 200 years that go by. And at the end of that 200-year period, the favor really ends up running out because now Israel is no longer seen to be a blessing because Jacob was a blessing, or Joseph was a blessing to Pharaoh. But now this huge nation is no longer a blessing, but instead they're a threat. So here we are. I want to make sure that we all have followed along here. Because we think about, uh, we all know the story of Moses leading his people out of Egypt and the plagues on Pharaoh and all that. But how did the Israelites get to Egypt? Well, this is their journey to Egypt. It came through Abraham. It came through Isaac. It came through Jacob. It, it came through those descendants. And so this, this vision that God gave Abraham where he said, your people are going to be more numerous than the stars in the sky, guess what? It's happened. And it's happened so effectively that Israel is now a threat. And so as Israel is seen as a threat, there's a new Pharaoh, there's a new king of Egypt. And we're going to look at what he does here in Exodus. This is pretty aggressive, kind of. But eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt, and he knew nothing about Joseph or what Joseph had done. So the, the lineage of Joseph and how Joseph saved Egypt from starvation and how Joseph led Egypt well and how Egypt prospered under Joseph's uh, authority with the Pharaoh, that is all gone. It's all washed out and no one remembers it anymore. And instead, there's this new king and he comes to power and he's like, Joseph who? Joseph what? All I see is that there's these people out there that are just multiplying like crazy and that kind of make me nervous. And this is what he says. He says to his people, look, the people of Israel, they now outnumber us. Isn't that amazing? God said that that would happen. And then here it is. It's happening. They now outnumber us and they are stronger than we are. So this new Pharaoh, insecure, he's getting a little nervous here. So these, these people have showed up and they've outnumbered us and they're super strong. What's going to happen if they decide to turn on us? And so in verse 10, he goes on to say that we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. So the Pharaoh says, no more of Israel growing as a nation. For if we don't, if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Now, meanwhile, there's been no war or no, uh, the Israelites have never turned a finger against uh, the Egyptians and it's been over 200 years since Joseph passed away. Still never turned a finger against the Egyptians. But this new guy comes in and he's paranoid and he's worried about it. And he says, what if war breaks out and they join the enemies and they fight against us? 
Then they will escape from the country. I thought that that was interesting because he doesn't say, then they will conquer us. See, the Israelites were purely seen to him as a potential commodity, as a workforce, as a labor force. So his biggest concern is not that they turn and that they murder all the Egyptians. His biggest concern is that they'll leave the country and they'll no longer have that potential asset in those people. And then he goes on in verse 11 and he says, so the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. So now Israel has gone from coming over and being given this prosperous land and growing and, and, and their, their uh, nation growing and becoming great. And now they're made slaves. And the Pharaoh actually appointed a brutal slave driver over them. And they were hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. And they forced them to build cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. So they start bearing down on Israel, start putting a force down on them, crushing, crushing force. Because what they think is, if we bear down hard enough on him, then when they go home, they won't make any more babies. They'll be too tired. They'll just go to sleep. But that doesn't work because we'll see that as they keep bearing down on them, they keep growing. And so in verse 12, it goes on to say this. It says that, but the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more they multiplied and expanded so that the Egyptians dreaded and were exasperated by the Israelites. And so I just thought that that was quite interesting that the, the opposite is happening. <clears throat> See, Pharaoh is not trying to do something super spiritual. He's trying to disrupt the family. If we work them hard enough, then they won't have the energy to enjoy life, to have fun. They'll be oppressed. And when they're oppressed, maybe they'll stop mating. Maybe they'll stop making babies. And that's what he's wanting to do. But instead, it goes the other way around. The more that they oppress them, the more babies Israel keeps making. They just keep producing and producing and producing. It's like a, a, a factory here. And so Pharaoh gets exasperated. Now, this is a term that I highlighted because every mom out here has felt this term, exasperated. And this is what it means, intensely irritated and frustrated. So Pharaoh is exasperated. And I know that moms out there can identify with that when your kids are laying down in the middle of pick and pay and they are throwing a fit, and you've got a full cart of groceries, and you hit that point in your mind of, do I leave this child, or do I leave the buggy and go home? And you really have to weigh that out. Do we want groceries, or do I want this child? Okay, Because you are exasperated. You're frustrated, and you're irritated, because you're just trying to get milk and eggs in your house, and this small monster is laying in the floor and keeping all that from happening. I see you. You guys are amazing, you moms. You are. When I walk through a grocery store, which I'm typically not allowed in because I buy dumb stuff, when I see those things happening, I'm like, man, just, just leave. Leave the child. Someone will, take, someone will take care of him. Just check out. Get your groceries. But what's also amazing is the community will just act like nothing's happening, you know? So we all understand each other. Oh, that's great. So the so the Pharaoh is irritated, super irritated and super frustrated because Israel's not doing what he wants them to do. And so he says, all right, fine. And he goes on in verse 13 and he says, I'm frustrated about this. But so then the Egyptians made the Israelites serve rigorously, forcing them into severe slavery. So now they've been made slaves and now they're severely made into slaves. And they, were, they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar, brick and all kinds of field work. All their labor was harsh and severe. So the Pharaoh's plan was to just oppress them, oppress them, oppress them. But it's not working. So again, let me catch you up here. Abraham's made a promise that he never thought could come true. And now you have a nation that's so great and so big and so wonderful that they become a threat to Egypt. And it's important that we understand how they even got to Egypt. You know, I've watched the story of, uh, of Moses, you know, the movies and read the stories of Moses leading people out of Egypt and freeing his people and parting the Red Sea and all of that. But I never actually stopped to think, well, why were they there anyway? Where did they even come from? This is where they came from. Is that Egypt was given to them as a blessing because they were a blessing to Egypt. And then 
Egypt turned on the Israelites and they became slaves in that land. But they are a huge, numerous group of people. And so as Pharaoh is trying to squash them out and stop them from growing and becoming an even greater nation, he comes up with a plan. And I call this the king of Egypt's plan A. And this is where he addresses the midwives. And I think that this next part is is hilarious. But Pharaoh goes to the midwives, uh, the Hebrew midwives, and he says to them, when you are are with the, the, the mom that's going into labor, you are to check that baby. And when that baby comes out, if it's a male, and, and the translation in the Bible is, is to check to see if it has stones, which I thought was, you know, kind of funny. Um, and it's literally, what they're saying is like, pick it up, examine. If it's got stones, it's to be put to death. If it's a female, it gets to live. If it's a male, it gets put to death. But the midwives, they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And so what the midwives did is they didn't kill any of the babies. But the babies kept coming out. The babies kept happening. And so Pharaoh finds out these babies keep getting made. These babies keep coming out and happening. But none of the midwives are putting the males to death because they keep growing and they keep coming out and they keep increasing in numbers. And so Pharaoh calls the midwives in and he's like, what's the deal? I thought I gave you really clear instructions. I feel like you've kind of gone around me here. Am I not your authority? Am I not your boss? So why is this happening? And here's the conversation between Pharaoh and the midwives. And it'll tell you that Pharaoh, he doesn't know anything about how babies happen. All right. And you're going to see that here. So Pharaoh says to the midwives, and he he says in, in, uh, in, in the verse here, so the king of Egypt, he called for the midwives and he said to them, so he says, why have you done this thing? And allowed the boy babies to live. Why are they alive? Why why are they not dying? And here's the the midwives answer. So the midwives answer to him. They say, Pharaoh, see the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. All right. You need to first understand that Pharaoh. We're dealing with a different breed of women. These women are, are different from your dainty Egyptian women. Instead, the Hebrew women are vigorous. And so he says that they are vigorous and they give birth quickly and their babies are born before the midwife can even get to them. (laughs) That's that's what they say. And Pharaoh says, "Okay, I'll come up with another plan. Obviously, Pharaoh is he doesn't know how this how this works. And, you know, if he's never been a part of of birth and how that happens, you know, he didn't have Google at the time Uh, when we had Benjamin. Benjamin like was fast. He came four hours from the first contraction to him being alive and on this planet. Benjamin is is there. And the midwife did have to speed to get to us and to help that process. So, you know, if it's fast enough, I can kind of see how that could happen. But then with with Wyatt, Casey's, you know, she her water broke thanks to Miss Adele. If if anybody wants to hurry up their pregnancy, they can see her and she'll do a massage and Force that kind of process along. So Casey's water breaks. She's past her due date. But then it's like, well, and I'm sitting there like she's a stick of dynamite. Like, how are you? Are you okay? Is it now? Is it now? Is it now? Is it now? And she's like, I feel fine. I think we ordered Butler's pizza. And I'm like, is it now? Now? So we're on Google and I'm thinking, we're asking like, how long uh, until after water breaks for the baby? Do you know, we're searching for this and Google's like, it could be you know, an hour to seven days. And I'm like, we cannot do this for seven days. You know, <laughs> this is going to be miserable. And, and finally she does. She goes into labor. We go to the hospital. We have the, the baby. But, and that was not a quick one. But I just think this is so funny that the midwives say, Pharaoh, your dainty little women, they take some time. But our vigorous Hebrew women, they don't even stop work. They just, you know, take a minute and, you know, it's... <laughs> It, you know, and Pharaoh's like, okay, well, if that's the way it is, then that's the way it is. Now, unfortunately, what Pharaoh does is he comes up with something even worse. Well, it's, it's actually not even worse, but it's more aggressive. It's something that they could not get around. And this is Pharaoh's plan B. And so he says, I want everyone, you guys know the saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, here, Pharaoh is saying, throw the baby out with the bathwater. If that male is born then that male is to be thrown out. 
That male is, is not, we're not even trying to stop the male being born. We're not asking that the midwives put it to death. I'm decreeing that every male born of Hebrew uh, descent is immediately put to death or thrown out. And so here's where he declares this. And then we look, in, and then Pharaoh in verse 22, this is all in Exodus 1 and Exodus 2, if you want to read this on your own. But then Pharaoh commanded all of his people saying, Every son who is born to the Hebrews must be thrown into the Nile, but every daughter you shall keep alive. So Pharaoh says, I want to throw, I want you to throw them into the Nile River. Now, why do you think that Pharaoh said, I want you to throw them into the Nile River? I've I've got a picture that should be coming up here. Um, There we go. That's why Pharaoh wanted the babies thrown into the Nile River. That is a Nile crocodile. So Pharaoh was, was saying, that baby goes in the river because what lives in the river are predators. And if I can't trust the midwives to put the boys to death, I know I can trust this guy and I can trust nature. And so every woman that is supposed to have a child, every single woman that's supposed to have a child is supposed to take that baby and throw it in the river and leave it to these right here. You know, that, that's where it kind of starts to get heavy. That, that's where we start to get to a place of like, oh man, this is, this is kind of a big deal here. And so then if we kind of circle back full story here, we kind of start to get to a place of understanding that, that first verse that I read you at the beginning. How do we get to a place where a woman is putting her child in a basket and waterproofing it and putting it into the reeds and pushing it out into the river? See, I want to highlight to you Moses' mom. And Moses' mom, she, she has kind of a hard name, and, and so we, we've got it up here for you. Amram and Jochebed. So this is Moses' dad, Amram. And then his mom, Jochebed, and they came out of the, uh, the, the tribe of Levi. So they're Hebrew. And they have a couple kids. And first, they have Miriam, which is Moses' sister. Moses isn't born yet. And Miriam is the older sister. Now remember, these children are being born into a time and into an area where a pharaoh has literally said, throw these babies into the Nile River so that nature will take care of them because I can't trust you to take care of them. But Miriam, being the older sister, she's okay. And now they have another child named Aaron. And Aaron, if you look future forward into this, Aaron is actually the the guy that would be Moses' assistant. You know, as Moses is leading the people out of Israel, Aaron was his right-hand guy. Well, Aaron was also his brother, and he was three years older than uh, he was three years older than Moses, and so Aaron at this time, at the time and place where the babies were thrown into the Nile, Aaron may have just been old enough that he could have kind of missed that window, but I guarantee you, Aaron's not cruising down the street like, "Hey, look at me, I'm three years old," you know, like like he's no, he's not. He's not playing with the ball in the yard. He's not chasing, you know, the pet dog. He's probably living in quite a bit of fear that a three-year-old could potentially be thrown into the river. And so this is their little family. And then something happens. I don't know if it was expected or unexpected, but in the worst possible time, they have another child. And here's, here's the verse. The woman This is talking about Moses' mom. She conceived and she gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was especially beautiful and healthy. Now, I know that every mom thinks that their baby is especially beautiful and healthy, but they're not. Some of your babies are ugly. I'm here to tell you that right now. All right? Listen, you think it. I'm just here to say it. But this baby was not an ugly baby. This baby was especially beautiful and healthy. And because of that, she hid him for three months to protect him from the Egyptians. She, she hid him. Now, when I think about this practically, it's, it's kind of easy to hide a baby in the beginning because they, they don't do much. They sleep 
they eat, they breastfeed. They, I mean, they, and even when they cry, it's kind of a, it, it's loud, but it's not that loud. And, and when you think about the context there of their community, you know, the whole community would have known that this baby was there and that they were hiding him. And so this baby probably would have been, the community would have helped to hide it and, and they could keep it quiet and they could know when guards or, or the, the Egyptians were coming through and they could, you know, kind of like soundproof it. And it, I don't know if you, if you guys have seen the movie, A Quiet Place, where, yeah, horrible movie. You guys, horrible, horrible movie. Because the, I can't watch that movie because there's a baby in it. The idea that they've got to keep this baby quiet when all this danger out there is happening. And for three months, these brave parents do that. They keep this baby hidden. And because of that, they actually earn a place in, in the, the faith hall of fame here. And in Hebrews 11, you can read the chapter, it lists all of like the, the MVPs of faith. It talks about all the things that they did that made them these faithful people, that made them examples of faith. And, and for them, they earn a spot there. They don't earn a spot there for anything except that they hid their baby for three months. So they hid him. And, and, and we look here at, at the next verse, and, and the story it kind of breaks down, and it says, By faith Moses, after his birth, was hidden for three months by his parents. Because they saw that he was beautiful and divinely favored child, and they were not afraid of the king's, the pharaoh's decree. That I've got this as Exodus, that's my fault. That is actually what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. If you scroll down about three quarters of the way down in Hebrews, this is the verse that they use to describe Moses' parents. This is the verse that earns them the space in the faith hall of fame. But... There comes a time when you can't hide a baby anymore, where the crying gets louder, where, where the baby has more needs, where, where it, it needs more from you, but it also starts to become a little bit aware and it starts to, you, you just can't hide that baby anymore. You know what we told some friends of, of ours that they're, they're in here, Brennan and Carla, when they had their baby, I said, hey, for the first two weeks, go to breakfast, go do coffee, get out of the house. Because as soon as that little monster is aware and awake just enough, you're going nowhere. <laughs> and, and Brendan who's in here said, Chris, that was pretty much, you know, right. It's like this false sense of this is going to be okay. And it's not. <laughs> but these, they can no longer hide the baby. So think about this. I, I want you to, I want moms this, this, is your, this is the moment for you. You've birthed a beautiful, beautiful child that you hid for three months. You hid this baby. And it took incredible faith for you to hide this baby for three months. And finally, when she could no longer hide him, I don't know if that was the community saying, hey, listen, you can't hide this baby anymore. You're going to get us all into trouble. I don't know if it was because the baby was crying louder. I don't know what it was, but for some reason, something happened. And three months later, she realized, I can no longer hide this baby. And what that means as a mom is she had to come to grips with the reality that because I can no longer hide this baby, this baby is subject to Pharaoh's rule. And that means that she has to give this baby up. And see, when we read this verse here, when we cruise through it in the Bible, when we read the story and we look at our children's Bible and it's got the illustrations and it's like we just roll right past it. This is a verse not to roll right past because when she realized that she could no longer hide him, she got a basket and she made it of papyrus reeds and she covered it with tar and pitch. Here we are again at the beginning. How did we get to this moment? See, it started with Abraham. And Abraham was given a promise that led a nation of people to be birthed in Egypt. That led to an enormous amount of favor. That 200 years later led to an enormous amount of slavery. That led to a Pharaoh who couldn't stop a nation from growing. That led to a decision being made that on this day, this mom had to put her baby in a basket. And let it go. And so she put the child in it and she set it among the reeds. 
by the bank of the Nile. Now, Moses at the time was three months old. And I want you to look at what she put in the basket. So guys, you can play a clip here. This is Wyatt. See that smile? This is three months old. I think he'll do it again here. It's a little seven second video. It's just on a loop here. This is what a three month old looks like. He's asleep and he's smiling in his sleep. This is what she put in a basket. I've got another picture here of, of Wyatt. Also at exactly three months. And this is what she put in the basket. See, we, we, we look at this and we think like, how can a mom put a baby in a basket and let it go into the river? How can that happen? I, you know, I don't know what the logistics were for that day. I don't know if, if, if I can imagine that Moses' mom knew Moses' nap schedule and knew when he slept the most and knew when he would be asleep at the deepest point. And maybe she couldn't fathom the idea of hearing her baby cry because when she put this in the basket, he doesn't know he's getting put in a basket and being abandoned and being put out to the wild. He doesn't know that. He lays down in that basket knowing that he's loved by his mom, knowing that, that he has security in his family, knowing that, that he can smile in his sleep because his life is wonderful. And so I can only imagine that this mom says, how do I do this? How do I, how? Okay, I know his nap schedule. I know that he goes down at this time. I know that he sleeps the most at this time. I know that. But... How can I let him go? And see, that this is, it's emotional for me because I see this face every day. She saw the face of Moses every day. And so she puts him in and she pushes him off. And I like to think that maybe she just ran. How fast can I get out of earshot so that if my baby wakes up crying... I don't have to hear it. And she runs and runs and runs. I don't know how you, how you do that. I don't know how you, how you get to a place where you're so oppressed and so enslaved by nation that you actually have to bring yourself to pushing this baby out. I know that, that she had hope. Do you know why I know she had hope? Because she made for this baby, she made a basket and she waterproofed it. She said, I may have to give it up, but I'm going to give it every single chance that it can have. And she does that and she pushes it off and then she leaves. And then for those of us that don't know the story, I'll tell you the rest of the story here. What ends up happening is Pharaoh's daughter comes down by the water and Pharaoh's daughter uh, comes down to bathe. And when she comes down to bathe by the Nile River, she has maidservants that are with her. And the Bible actually says that the maidservants are surveying the banks. They're walking up and down the banks. And they're doing this because they want to make sure that the river is safe for Pharaoh's daughter to go and, and bathe in it. And as they're surveying the banks, they see something. Pharaoh's daughter sees something. She sees a, a basket. She tells him, go and fetch it. And she brings it over. And she opens it up and she sees a baby. And she has compassion. Why does she have compassion? Because this baby is crying. I mean, just thank, thank God that Moses' mom wasn't there to hear the baby cry. But I don't know how long Moses had been in the water. I don't know how long he'd been out there. I don't know if it was days, if it was hours, if it was months. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that these maidservants, they find him and that she hears him cry and she has compassion on him. Even though he's of Hebrew descent, she knows that this baby's been placed here because he's supposed to die. He's a Hebrew baby. But she has compassion. And in that, in that moment... Something incredible happens. A superhero swoops in, and it's Miriam. 
It's Moses' older sister. And what she had been doing is she had been sitting on the side of the river and she had been watching. She was watching her brother. And, and I've got the verse here for you. They'll put it up. And his sister Miriam stood some distance away to find out what would happen to him. Mom couldn't stay there, but sister did. And so she takes this opportunity that as soon as Pharaoh finds, uh, Pharaoh's daughter finds this baby, Miriam sees it. And she sees that, that, that there's a chance and a hope. And so she does the most bold thing ever. She, a Hebrew woman worth nothing, enslaved to the Egyptians, goes right up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, I see you found a Hebrew baby. Do you need someone to nurse it for you? And Pharaoh's daughter, who, took, who had compassion, she says, I do. And Miriam says, well, I'll go find you a wet nurse. And so Miriam goes off and she gets Moses' mom. Says, I mean, could you imagine as a mom what you've gone through with letting your baby go? And then now all of a sudden your oldest daughter runs into your house and says, surprise, look at what's happening. Come with me. Moses is still alive. And so the mom comes and, and Pharaoh's daughter gives Moses back to his mom and says, okay, I want you to nurse him until he's ready to wean off and then he'll become my daughter or he'll become my son. And then she also says, and I'm going to pay you wages for it. And so you have this mom that's restored with her baby, and now she's going to get paid to take care of that baby. See, when, when Moses' mother let go of the basket, she gave up something precious, trusting that God would take care of it and perhaps find a way to give it back to her. See, this, this is a beautiful sort of story way to, to put it. But I don't think that Moses' mom walked away and said, all right, God, I'm giving up this precious thing and hopefully one day you'll give it back to me. I think she put all her hope into a basket. That's why I called this Hope Floats because she made this basket waterproof so that it would float. And so this mom is given this opportunity to take her child back. And that's why the, today's message is, is for you moms, because I know how much you love. I know how deeply you care. And I know that there has been situations in your life where I don't want to compare it to the loss of a child, but there's been lots of situations in your life where you've had to let go of your children and you've had to let your children go out and do and make decisions and, and it's been scary and you've hoped that they would come back to you. But and I know that you've done everything you can to equip them. You've made the waterproof basket for them. You've put your hope into, into God for them and, and you hope that it can come back to you. But I also know that this whole idea of, of this statement here, she gave up something precious, trusting God would take care of it. I know that there's moments where, you know what, that doesn't mean anything. Because what you're doing is you're running away so that you don't hear that baby cry. And I want to recognize you moms that, that you are so special and that you carry something that we'll never understand. I, I want to close out with one statement here. Jordan, you can put the, the last uh, slide up here. And th this statement here is, 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 uh, is, why does this matter to you? See, God's plan. God had this beautifully planned for Moses this plan for him. He had this plan for his mom, and eventually he had the plan for the people of Israel, right? How did we get to the point where a baby was put in a basket? It had everything to do with the nation of Israel and God's plan for Israel. But God skillfully guided, look what happened. He skillfully guided the parents of Moses. They hid him for three months. He skillfully guided the currents of the Nile. He kept the baby safe while he was in the water. That wasn't happen chance, that was God. Splitting the currents, keeping the animals away, letting it get stuck in the reeds, letting it get tucked away in the current and hidden there. God did all that. And then 
God skillfully softened the heart of Pharaoh's daughter because he had a promise to keep. And that promise goes all the way back to Abraham, where he said, I'm going to make this nation great. And what's amazing for us and why this matters for you is that the promise that God had to keep that brought Moses back to his mother is the same promise that extends to us. That God set aside a nation of people, a special people for himself. And then when Jesus came, he took that promise and he put his body on the line for us and he died on the cross for us so that that promise to keep extended past the Old Testament, past all those people, and to any person in this room or any person in history that gives their life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. See, Pharaoh couldn't, couldn't stop that promise. And I want you to know that if you feel like that promise is being stopped in your life, it can't. But there's a God that's skillfully navigating your situation, that's skillfully navigating... Um, the, the Nile River. I mean, if God can move a river to keep a baby safe, imagine what he can do in your life here. But your one takeaway today, like I said, it would be easy. I wanted you to identify with, with what this mom went through. And then the one takeaway that I want you to take home today is that all of this happened because God had a promise to keep. And that promise didn't stop there. That promise continues to you in your seats right where you are. So we're going to bow our heads in prayer and then we're going to have a, a quick worship song. And Heavenly Father, we just thank you for...